Recording this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Your discretion is advised. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight, on Grand Theft Autobiographies. Bad influences, bad choices, and bad karma. Tonight we will follow the story of two men born and raised in one of the most impoverished areas of Liberty City, and their struggle to stay alive by whatever means necessary. We will see a man pigeonholed into a role that he never wanted, that he was ironically quite good at, and that man's moral dilemma when faced with the potential consequences of his many hasty choices. We will see drug empires, the change that people go through being a part of that business, and the inevitable results of living that criminal lifestyle, as we follow the rise and potential fall of Dwayne Forge and Trey Stewart, aka Playboy X. This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. By supporting the channel for less than $2 American a month, you can get early access to videos, the ability to download episodes, and nearly 100 original music tracks, many of which are extended versions of the tracks that are on streaming services. A very special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Aussie, Diecastinator, Chuck K45, and Miles Garrett. All of you are amazing, and your support is something I truly can't express my gratitude for fully. Thank you so much. Today's episode is sponsored in part by my executive producers Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Diecastinator. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99 where they play games such as NHL and MLB, and story-based games like the Red Dead Redemption series, with plenty more story-based games to come soon. Mason Collin's podcast channel, We're About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Chuck K45's channel, who's working on setting up a channel all about buying farm equipment and fixing it up, and then starting a new farm from scratch, and Die Castinator's channel, where they examine, review, and discuss all things Diecast, from the history of the hobby to rare models, and much more, with new videos basically every day, in addition to buying and selling and trading the Diecast cars. All links in the description, and a very big thank you to all of my patrons. Your support is literally helping me to keep the lights on, so from the bottom of my little black heart, thank you all so very much. Support the channel by showing my executive producers some love, or sign up yourself today. And now, back to the video. Our story tonight begins in Algonquin in the early 1970s, specifically the neighborhood of North Holland, a part of the city often considered to be among the most impoverished, and a place where the elusive American dream never seemed farther from. Both of our subjects would be born and raised in this part of Liberty, with Dwayne Forge being born in 1973 and Trey Stewart a decade later in 1983. Dwayne would specifically be raised in the Westminster Towers, or as they were often known, just the Westminster Projects, on Galveston Avenue, a complex that was notorious for violence, drug use, and just about everything else that you don't want kids growing up around. It likely comes as no surprise, then, that Dwayne's father was a drug dealer himself, as well as a pimp with a knack for violence against both his son and his wife, Dwayne's mother. Not a particularly powerful or high-level drug dealer, as far as our research showed, Dwayne's father was a womanizing and dishonest crook, even for someone in his line of work, and would regularly beat Dwayne after drilling the idea into his head that he should only expect the worst, and then he would always be pleasantly surprised. Clearly this attitude of glass-half-empty pessimism, as well as an expectation that life would always try to screw you over, would indeed be passed on to Dwayne, 
but at least at first, Dwayne would attempt to reject the violent part of his father's life as he himself grew into a young man in and around the Westminster projects. It isn't entirely clear when, but at some point when Dwayne was still relatively young, his father would be murdered right in front of the family's front door. Though it also isn't clear if Dwayne directly witnessed his father's death or simply happened upon his corpse later on. Either way, according to Dwayne, he would feel nothing when his father died, and if anything, even be a little bit happy, and would eventually go on to try and find his own path without slipping into the same role his father had from a lack of choices. In the early 1990s, after he turned 18, Dwayne would even attempt to become an LCPD officer, though Dwayne claimed that the LCPD was still heavily discriminating against African Americans in the 1980s, which likely continued well into the 90s, given that Dwayne would only have been able to try and join as early as 1991. When he was rejected, Dwayne would be forced to reflect on his life and re-examine his available choices, and given his minimal education and large physical stature, he would eventually, unfortunately, fall right into the same business his father had been in, selling drugs. As for Trey Stewart, born in the early 1980s, much less is known about his childhood, though it seems fairly safe to assume that he also grew up under similar conditions to Dwayne, possibly even in the very same housing project. His involvement in the drug game, however, would be directly facilitated by Dwayne, while Stewart was still likely just a kid. Although Dwayne would, as we said, at some point attempt to join the LCPD, it isn't entirely clear when, since, reportedly, he made his entry into the drug business as early as 1988, at the age of 15. It seems likely that he fell into selling drugs young and briefly attempted to get out of that life, but was turned down or discouraged from truly pursuing a career in law enforcement. Instead, he would put all of his chips into the drug trade and begin expanding his reach around North Holland, as he became an adult in the early 1990s. He would also at some point recruit Trey Stewart into his crew and begin showing him the ropes at a young age, taking on the role of a pseudo-father to Stewart, whose real father we can only assume was either not in the picture or took minimal interest in his son's life. By the late 1990s, Dwayne would be one of the most powerful and successful drug kingpins in the city. According to him, at the height of his power, he would be making close to $50,000 a week, and at several apartments, all full of cash, as well as many of the expected luxuries, like fast cars and expensive clothes. Despite this enormous success, though, there would be a very noticeable downside for Dwayne. As he became more and more powerful and well-known in North Holland, he would also become increasingly distant from most people, as his wealth and success made opportunists out of many of his so-called friends, with few exceptions. Two of these exceptions would be his protege, Trey Stewart, who was likely going by the street name Playboy X by that point, as well as the woman that he described as being the love of his life, Cherise Glover. As the years ticked by, Dwayne would become increasingly paranoid and in his own words, miserable constantly mired in the jealousy of others and feeling like the life that he'd actually wanted to live was forever out of his reach. He would express an interest in starting a family, likely with Charisse, and settling down into a more normal humdrum lifestyle, but due to his lengthy history as a drug dealer by that point, gave up on that dream fairly quickly, believing it could just never happen for a man like him. Perhaps because of this, or perhaps simply because it was good business, he would also invest quite heavily into Liberty City's adult entertainment industry, when he bought the Triangle Club in Bohan, as well as many different pornography shops in and around Algonquin. In 1999, a member of Dwayne's organization, Javon Simpson, would be arrested by the LCPD as a small-time dealer, and it would mark the beginning of the end for Dwayne's reign as the neighborhood's top dog. In order to avoid seeing jail time himself, Simpson would become an informant to the LCPD, and spill enough information on his friends and employers, including Dwayne, to see him arrested for possession of a controlled substance with intent to sell. And finally, Dwayne would actually see jail time, as he had previously avoided incarceration three times up to that point. At first, Dwayne would attempt to continue running his gang from prison with some success, but unsurprisingly, this would not last for very long. He would continue to provide for Charisse whilst inside, using what money he still had saved up and the income he was still making from the streets, while he continued to run the gang from prison. But this too would eventually cease, as life on the inside began to weigh on Mr. Forge's psyche. In fact, Dwayne would end up spending almost the entirety of his prison time on suicide watch, and would regularly see a therapist for psychological counseling to deal with his many mental burdens. During this time, his protege and second-in-command, Playboy X, would take control of his empire and rapidly begin expanding and evolving the organization beyond simply dealing crack in and around the projects. 
Playboy would begin making bigger and bigger deals for not only drugs, but even legitimate business, expanding into the music industry and even purchasing real estate. He would for a time regularly visit Dwayne in prison, but by 2004, he would stop coming entirely, and Dwayne's only other connection to his old life, Sharice, would also soon leave him. At some point, Sharice would start a relationship with the very same man who had been responsible for Dwayne being caught in the first place, Javon Simpson. And since it is unknown exactly when this relationship started, it is entirely possible that it was, at least briefly, during the time that Dwayne was still providing Sharice with money for cars, houses, apartments, and whatever else she wanted. By 2008, Playboy X had become not only the new head of Dwayne's former criminal empire, but a much bigger and more powerful player than Dwayne had ever been, making deals with international criminals and attempting to go legit by buying his way into real, non-criminal organizations that wouldn't even necessarily need to serve as fronts. It was in 2008 that both Dwayne and Playboy would meet a man who serves as a major throughline for many of the subjects that we have already covered, and will be covering on this season of GTA Biographies, Nico Bellic. Sometime that year, Dwayne would finally see the end of his prison sentence, likely reduced on good behavior as he served a roughly nine-year stint. He would attempt to contact Playboy, but his calls would be ignored, and eventually, he would simply turn up at Playboy's penthouse in Northwood, while he was having a meeting with Nico to employ the crafty mercenary for his own benefit. Hey, what's up, money? Hey, come on. Ladies, give me a few minutes. Business calls. <laughs> this is my town. Look at it. All them tiny ants down there. Man, shit is crazy. So I guess you do okay. Yeah, okay. But uh, what about you? What motivates you? Hmm. Well, I need money. This pays. I can do it. I don't care if I live or die, and I'm looking for someone. Someone special? Yeah, you could say that. So, why do you need me? Well, I'm always looking for good guys. Build an army. But in my work, the people change. Money changes people, not me. See, I'm still a hustler from these streets. And I heard good things about you. Okay. But, I'm warning you, I'm not low budget. <laughs> Do I look like I live low budget, dog? Your player! <laughs> fuck you want? There's someone here for you. Dwayne or some shit, I don't know. Motherfucker got out? Damn! My dude! What's up, son? What's going down? You didn't tell me you was getting out? Man, I would've laid on a party, got some freaks out, shit. I call couple of times. Man, hey, Dwayne, uh, this is Nico. Hey. Nico Dwayne Ford. Taught me everything I know. Psst. Not everything. So, hey, man, where you staying? You need some money? What's the plan? What you mean, what's the plan? Pick up where we left off. I'm out. I'm back. We keep on rolling. You say we? Yeah, we. Unless you too fine. What, your silk sheet, fancy dress wearing life too big for me now? Oh, hey, I ain't saying that. You know what's mine's is yours. You need help, just holler. Hell, this Slavic motherfucker any good, he can help you. Hey, you know I do anything I can. Uh, but right now, we gotta roll. Just give me one second. Ain't folk quick to forget. Hmm. Some folk. Psh, yeah, that's the truth. Where did you get out from? Preschool. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Dwayne, we gotta roll. Please make yourself at home. Hell, this is your home. Let's jet money. 
motherfucker must think I'm an idiot. Playboy would attempt to amicably deal with Wayne and, at least according to him, offer Dwayne half of the criminal empire he'd inherited, but Dwayne would simply be insulted by the offer, given that it had been him who created the empire to begin with. He would also give Dwayne enough cash for him to get a small apartment and help him survive while he recovered, and attempted to re-establish his reputation. He would also even put Dwayne in contact with Nico Bellic, offering his services while agreeing to pay Nico for his time. What Playboy may not have anticipated, though, was that Nico and Dwayne would get along very well. Oh, it's you. You alone? Yeah, how you doing? Fucking great. What you think? Yeah, it's hard living with the past, huh? Yeah, especially when the president's turned into an asshole. Psh, <laughs> fucking bitch. Nobody wants to roll with me no more. It's like I'm tainted. What do you mean? Playboy don't want to hang no more. He pays for you to come over instead. My girlfriend, the love of my fucking life. Man, I was pulling moves in the joint so this bitch could pay rent. Now she won't answer the phone. Man, I gave her everything when I was inside. Cars, houses, apartments, bank accounts, everything. Mm. I heard she hanging with Javon now. Who? Some punk who fucking talked. Swears he wasn't involved in me going down, but I knew. I knew his ass was lying. Now motherfuckers fucking my girl? Mm. For real? Shit is fucked up, man. Sometimes I just want to end this shit. Just bam. But I ain't there yet. Mm -mm, not quite. Listen, why don't you go talk to her? Psh, ain't shit to say. Then I'll go speak to both of them. They'll ask for your money back, and if they don't agree, I'll make them. Where did they hang out? At some arcade in Chinatown. Uh, look, man, don't bother. No, I'll bother. I'm getting paid. And besides, you remind me of me. Uh -huh. Nico would agree to help Dwayne not only because he was getting paid by Playboy to do so, but also because he saw a great deal of himself in Dwayne and sympathized with his situation. When confronting Dwayne's ex, Sharice Glover, along with his new lover, Javon, Nico would manage to collect on the debt the two of them owed him and kill Javon for betraying Dwayne. Sharice's fate, however, was harder to pin down. We spoke to multiple conflicting sources who claimed that Sharice had been spared by Nico and that she'd been killed alongside Javon, but our attempts to contact her directly were met with dial tones, so we cannot say with any degree of certainty what happened to her. We believe, however, based on our own investigations into Nico, that the most likely outcome was that he did not kill her given her lack of direct involvement in the criminal lifestyle that he and Dwayne were a part of. I collected on that debt for you. They paid up? Guess my name still means something out there. People are still scared of me. They are. I got rid of Javon for you, but I let your ex go. That fool Cherise, she just couldn't help herself. She always told me she'd burn me good. Guess I should've listened. Happy she ain't dead, though. She just an idiot. Peace, man. Nico would also continue to do work for Playboy directly, helping him to deal with the Mafia strike at a building site owned by the billionaire entrepreneur Yusef Amir, whom Playboy wanted to win the favor of, though it wouldn't exactly work out the way that Playboy had anticipated, as well as assassinate a street dealer who had been loudly badmouthing Playboy in his own neighborhood, Marlon Bridges. What's up, money? Not much. How are you? Chilling. It's all good. Well, mostly good. Mostly? Yeah, Dwayne's been getting on my nerves, pushing me, man. But whatever, we spoke about that shit already. Uh, give him time, he's just out of prison. <laughs> For real. Listen, G, Dwayne ain't the only thing I got on my mind. No? No. Some motherfucker's been calling me a phony, calling me a snitch, calling me all kinds of bullshit. Big deal. Yeah, big deal. Damn right. Until I discover that same motherfucker, well, he's got some real loose lips. Not bad. So, you'll need this guy silenced? Yeah, he hangs out with his team near the courts on Exeter between X and W. Okay, what does he look like? Well, son ain't too diesel or nothing. And he a regular looking dude, know what I mean? 
Now, he don't flash his guap too much, but you can see it in his eye. He a hustler. Eh? <sighs> Homie ain't too brawling, but he ain't scrawny neither. And he be styling on him a little, you dig? I mean, he ain't too bummy, but he grimy too. So, he's the average one? Look, he's brown skin B. Motherfucker be rocking baggy clothes, all that. Jewels, and he stay fresh with the clean sneakers. Know what I mean? And sometimes a band down. Look, I need more than that to go on. Jesus! Here, take this. Head down there. Take a photo, send it to me, and I'll point out which one of them motherfuckers it is. Fine. And that's a little gift for you. Things would begin to change, however, on Nico's second job for Dwayne, which directly conflicted with Playboy's interests. See, while Dwayne was inside, the ownership of his former gentleman's club, the Triangle Club, had been given to the Trunches brothers, who continued to run it in partnership with Playboy. It isn't entirely clear if Playboy had a direct interest in the club itself, or simply had a friendly business relationship with the Trunches brothers, and considered them allies. But whatever the case, he would not be pleased when he learned that Nico killed the brothers and emptied the club for Dwayne to take back. Furious at Dwayne's deliberate attempts to undermine Playboy's generosity, at least as he saw it, Playboy would almost immediately, and with minimal hesitation, start thinking of the best way to get Dwayne out of the picture permanently, without feeling like it was his fault or his decision. Sup, money? Hey. Man. Business is tough. Now, I ain't a cold person. Well, I mean, I am cold, but... Motherfucker. What are you talking about? You want a drink? Uh, man, have a seat, man. All right. Now, I got into this dope gang because it was the only thing that was open to me, man. The only thing, man. Hey, I am not judging. No, listen. Now, I paid my dues. Now, I learned in a hard school, man. And I changed stuff. You know me. I do this stuff so I got a chance to do some good in this town. So you say. So I say. So I do. When I get the money, man, I will build parks. I will sponsor kids. I will save lives. But I got to have the money, man. Is all this? All this, it means nothing if you ain't got the heart, Nico. Amen, brother. <laughs> I mean, fuck, man. Fuck! The thing is, you know, Jesus, he did some crazy shit, too. I mean, everyone does. He killed people. He killed that John the Baptist cat. He did what he had to. I don't think you're correct about that. Man, the point is, man, history is a long time. And you only got one chance. And Dwayne, man, Dwayne, it's like he thinks it's 1992, and the best that you could hope for is a gold chain and a pager. You know, he looks at me like he wants me dead. Now, I took care of business. I gave him money, but because I won't bow down to him and treat him like he the almighty, motherfucker wants to pop me. Dwayne is a little troubled. He was in prison a long time. Maybe you guys should talk. No, I tried talking. No, I... I tried giving him half of the business. I tried everything a man could reasonably try and still call himself a man. <laughs> so what you gonna do? Kill him? Hey, I didn't say that. Man, you cold. I was joking. But what else is there? I mean, Cash been talking. Now I hear things. Said you and me was too tight now. Said you disrespected him. Called him mad. He's going crazy. I mean, he's gone. Prison does that. Well, you can't kill him. Nope. But you can. But I don't want to. Well, neither do I, man. But if he goes insane, we all dead anyway. I mean, Dwayne is a killer. Uh, I don't like this conversation. Do you think that I do? But it's kill or be killed out there. You got a lunatic after you? Man, you dumb. 
Now I will give you a lot of money. Because see me? Now I ain't scared of no one. But a motherfucker says he's gonna kill me, and motherfucker's gonna die. Hmm. Man, I'm not sure. I got to think about it. Well, I hope you see some sense. I will be in touch. Unfortunately, this is yet another situation where our investigations could not determine for certain what the outcome was. We know for a fact that Nico had serious reservations about killing Dwayne and little love for Playboy X. However, it must also be remembered that Nico Bellic was at this time still quite desperate to make and save money, to stay out of the squalor that he'd been living in and keep himself and his cousin above water, especially with his cousin's dangerous tendency to gamble half of the money he'd make away. We also know that Dwayne himself asked Nico to kill Playboy instead of him, though we believe it was in direct response to learning of Playboy's desire to see him killed, and not a spur-of-the-moment decision as it had been for Playboy. We here at GTA Biographies believe, based on our knowledge of Nico Bellic's character and his sympathy towards Dwayne, that the most likely outcome of the Holland play was the death of Trey Stewart, Playboy X, and not Dwayne Forge. But unsurprisingly, we were unable to get in contact with either man in the present day, and only received conflicting information from all of the sources that we interviewed. Perhaps the only person that truly knows is Nico Bellic himself. Ew, Playboy X! Hey, yo, Whitey's back! Yo, what you doing? You got rid of Dwayne already? I thought the old dog would've put up more of a fight. <laughs> I didn't kill Dwayne. Well, what you doing back here then? Step to it, motherfucker. Well, I was thinking that maybe Dwayne is not the problem. Maybe it's you. Motherfucker! You think you can touch this shit? You think I got here by letting little bitches like you fuck with me? I own you! Nobody owns me! Either way, following these events, our knowledge of either man's life effectively vanishes as they either were both killed or whoever survived stayed quiet enough to avoid popping up on our radar while researching this episode. Dwayne Forge was a empathetic man in a criminal world, whose minimal education and lack of opportunities, combined with his bigger stature, sent him down the road of a reluctant criminal kingpin. Well, reluctant may be a slightly strong word here, but there is little doubt that Dwayne was not as naturally sadistic or greedy as the likes of Trey Stewart, even if he did not hesitate to indulge himself just like Playboy, with expensive apartments, cars, and other luxuries that he never dreamed he'd actually have. Dwayne was a conflicted man. Well aware that what he was doing was wrong, but too comfortable or too scared to try and escape the life that he'd been raised around and that had taken a heavy toll on his mother, and even been the death of his father. Much like Nico, he was a man who may have been a much better person in a different life with better opportunities, but he was too weak-willed or simply unlucky to get out while he still could, and by the time he'd established himself in that life, it seemed far too late to turn back. Trey Stewart, on the other hand, was an opportunistic, greedy, and self-righteous individual who valued very little besides himself, even if he paid lip service to being loyal and having integrity. Playboy X was always primarily concerned with how others saw him, and not what he actually was doing or the impacts his actions had on the world around him. He claimed to be interested in becoming a philanthropist and to be selling drugs with the hope of eventually going completely legit and building schools, parks, and providing for kids like himself who had few opportunities in the streets of North Holland and beyond, but it remains to be seen if this is actually true. You see, in practice, Playboy spent his wealth on luxury condos, expensive vehicles, parties, and women, and viewed just about every interaction with someone he wasn't sleeping with as a business opportunity, or a means to an end. He rarely showed regret or sympathy for others, however, at least one of the people that we spoke to who claimed that Dwayne was the one who was killed in the Holland play also claimed that Playboy deeply regretted this decision to have his former mentor killed, and cut off ties with Nico following Dwayne's death, suggesting that even he, 
underneath all of his bravado and ego, cared for the man who taught him everything he knew, even if most of the time he cared a whole lot more about himself. As we've said so far this season, we are no longer attempting to pin down all of the possible crimes committed by subjects we examine on this program, due to the increasing possibility of legal action being brought on our parent company, Weasel, who are already experiencing a tumultuous media scandal. Instead, we will keep our assumptions vague and go over what crimes we know for sure they were arrested for or charged for, starting with Dwayne Forge. As we mentioned before, Dwayne was arrested a total of four times, with his final arrest in 1999 resulting in his nine-year jail sentence, likely at Alderney State Correctional Facility. Dwayne was arrested for the first time in 1989 at the age of 16 for burglary, a second time two years later at the age of 18 in 1991 for possession of a controlled substance, cocaine, a third time in 1994 at the age of 21 for tax evasion at the height of his criminal empire's power, and finally in 1999 at the age of 26 for possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute, for which he was finally jailed. Playboy X, on the other hand, was only ever arrested once, the same year that Dwayne was, 1999, for a similar charge, possession of a controlled substance, cocaine. Though perhaps because it was his first offense on record, he would manage to avoid jail time altogether. Between Dwayne and Playboy, they were almost certainly responsible for an untold number of murders, numerous counts of drug dealing, distribution, and racketeering, on top of a slew of other crimes for which they never were, and likely never will be, charged. Given the power that Dwayne had at the height of his empire, and that Playboy only expanded the business beyond that, it can safely be assumed that these two men were among the most dangerous, and once the most feared men in North and East Holland, and maybe even all of Liberty City. What causes someone to drive down that road of crime? Is it the lack of opportunities afforded to many of the people living in America even to this day? Is it the lack of education provided for many of the nation's youth and especially minorities? Or is it simply because some people were born to be bad? Who knows? What I know is that America is a dangerous place, folks. Stay indoors, people. You never know if that guy sitting in the corner of the Cluck and Bell is secretly planning to assassinate you for giving him the stink eye. I'll see you next time on Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host. Guinness Walker. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you.